And before I introduce the rest of the evening, I want to tell you we have something very special for you right now. Joining us via telephone for a teleconference is the eminent writer and just so, so much more, Mr. Nat Hentoff. Nat, can you hear me? It's Clifford Brown, Jr. Hello, Nat, can you hear me? That I can hear, yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Nat, it's Clifford Brown, Jr. Thank oh, you. Oh, uh, pleased to meet you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. This is obviously very special for me. You conducted what I consider to be the only two definitive interviews with my dad. Can you talk to me a little bit about some of your memories of Clifford Brown? Well, to begin with, as a reporter for many years, my day job has, has ranged from getting to know and sometimes even become friends with a wide range of people. But I've never met anyone quite like your father. He had such openness. There was no guile, no malice. He had extraordinary generosity of spirit. You know, Duke Ellington once said, a musician's sound is his soul. Well, your dad had a remarkable soul. And I first wrote about him in Downbeat, and the head was not my, the headline wasn't mine. It was Clifford Brown, the New Dizzy. That was in the early 50s. And he wasn't just an acolyte of Dizzy, although he had characteristics similar to Dizzy. He also, Dizzy was also a man of extraordinary generosity of spirit. But already, your father had his own sound, his own impact. And in the interview, you said something that another musician of, I guess, permanent fame, if we keep having a civilization, uh, your father said that Benny Harris had a gig with Charlie Parker, but Harris had to leave for some reason, and Clifford Brown substituted. And he told me that uh, one night, Bird took him into a corner and said, I don't believe it. I hear what you're doing, what you're saying, but I don't believe it, which was quite a tribute. Uh, your father was very, I mean, an interview with him was, all I had to do was almost say hello, and, and uh, j I had a couple of leading questions, but he was extraordinarily ordered, as he was in his music, uh, and articulate isn't the word. And when he joined Max Roach, I talked to him again for Downbeat, and he said something that reminded me of something else. I'll get to it in a second. He said, the policy, our policy, he said, of he and Max, is to aim for the musical extremes of both excitement and subtle softness whenever each is necessary, but, and this was Clifford Brown, but with a lot of feeling in everything. He said, we're trying more and more to have our solos built into each arrangement so that it all forms a whole and creates emotional and intellectual tension. Years later, Max Roach was teaching for a while at the University of Massachusetts, and he said something that brought back what your father said to me in that interview. Max said, you know, when you think about it, what we do in jazz, we musicians, is like the Constitution. E individuals, each individual, listening very intently to one another and then creating a whole. Well, <laughs> that's what jazz is. If only the Constitution itself were more alive these days, but that's another story that I write about with so far no effect at all. Now, another thing I'd like to say, the, to me, the most authoritative reference work in jazz is Richard Cook's Penguin uh, Jazz Encyclopedia. Alas, it is now the late Richard Cook, but it's being continued. Anyway, what what he wrote about Richard Brown, about sorry about Clifford Brown, was that he could get all over the horn within.
incomparable fluency. His high range as easily covered as his middle and low, but this was amplified, dig this, by his voluptuous sound and vibrant and vibrato and the joyful assurance he seemed able to switch on without any warming up passages. That's why it was such a joy to listen to him. But it wasn't always, I mean, fluency and the, the, the skill is only a small part of his impact. He always told a story. As Coltrane once said to me, in, this, in what we do, we have to tell stories. And going back to what Cook said, he seems to get better and better as he goes on. And the final icing was his composing, which again had the marks of, uh, this is a phrase that really applies to Clifford Brown, natural greatness. And that reminded me of something that a friend of mine, Phoebe Jacobs, says about her longtime friend, Louis Armstrong. Phoebe is now head of the Armstrong Educational Foundation. And every once in a while, she appears at some institute that has been funded by the, uh, by the Armstrong Educational Foundation because Louis told her before he went and that he'd, he'd gotten such goodness from people, he wanted to repay it. So there are all kinds of Armstrong activities. And, she, and Phoebe said, people say Louis Armstrong is dead. He is not dead. He's still giving. He's giving not only in these activities of the foundation, but in his music. And the same can be said of Clifford Brown, because his music is still, and that means he is still very much alive. So it is a privilege to be able to say anything here tonight, and I'm very glad you asked me to do that, because like uh, a lot of people, I think, at least in what I do, spending time hopelessly writing about the genocide in Darfur, uh, the genocide of the last eight years, you know, the, the Bush-Cheney assaults on the Constitution, etc. Every once in a while, I have to get regenerated. So I listen to Lester Young, Duke Gellington, and Clifford Brown, and that always brings me back up. We're speaking with Nat Hintoff, And Nat, thank you so much for those words. You know, I, I never heard my father's sound described as voluptuous. I hadn't read that. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, that was part of it. That was a, uh, well, I, I don't want to sound hyperbolic, but I, that's the way I feel about it. There was a glory to his playing. I mean, it's, it's something you hear, let's say, in Beethoven's Ninth, if I can jump that sense. But he, that natural greatness was something that very few people have in music or anything else. And that's why talking to him was always something I much enjoyed and uh, kept remembering and still do. A quick question. Throughout my life, since I was only six months old when my father died, I I've really tried to separate what was the hype about Clifford Brown and what was really him, what was the true man. I it's obvious he was a very gifted musician. That, that doesn't even do it justice. It's obvious that there was musical genius. But your interactions with him, when everyone s speaks of how kind and how gentle and forthcoming he was, you know, tell me, was that really how you found him to be? Well, that's why I started out by saying, of all the people I've known, and I've known so many just as a reporter, I don't know anybody except maybe Clark Terry, who's an old friend of mine, of whom I can say I've never heard an, any malice. He never put anybody down. I mean, your father had strong feelings about us. He used to put it the economics of this business, which is still, well, I mean, most people have this mythology that if, if you're well-known, you must be okay financially, but most players... Even well-known players don't have medical plans or pension plans, and Clifford was aware of that. He was always concerned about the economics of jazz. But talking to him was natural, and that is 
not very often the case with people. It had nothing to do with, you know, he had he had great gathering fame, not only among uh, uh, fellow musicians, but he was known around the world as young as he was. But there was no, to use an old phrase, no side to him. He was always himself, and that himself was utterly direct. Uh, and again, he there was there was no that's it there was no hype at all in Clifford. So that's an answer to you. I don't know what the hype about him is. All I know was the authentic Clifford Brown, and that was utterly unique. Well, thank you. That definitely answers my question, Nat. You know, you've done so much for our music, and I want to thank you and take just a moment to thank you for that because you've not only brought more exposure to the people who make this music, exposure that's sorely needed, but you've also told their stories in a way that I think people who aren't even fans of our music yet can enjoy. So I, I really want to thank you, and I'd like to ask the audience to join me in thanking you for that. Well, I appreciate that. I, you know, the one thing I, I have to say about that is I was thinking, I always think about this, my life would have been so much grayer without what this music has done for me. And if I've contributed anything, almost everything I've done, especially in the last 30 or 40 years, is not, you know, how many passing chords he, somebody knows or what the polyrhythms are. I, I figured out early on from the time I, Ben Webster gave me a credo for the rest of my life. He said to me once when his rhythm section wasn't making it, he said, kid, remember, when the rhythm section ain't making it, go for yourself. And that kind of individuality, and something Ellington used to tell me, forget categories. It's always the individual. And Clifford Brown was, to use an Ellington phrase, beyond category. But being able to be in contact with their music and them themselves, so most of what I do in all my books is interviews, because it's important for people to know who the person is from which this music comes. So I've, jazz has done much more for me, and I'm not jiving, than I've ever done for it. Well, I, I actually think that's probably true. However, I, I want to acknowledge all that you've done for us and for the music. So I thank you again. Well, thank you all again, and I'm so pleased that this evening is happening. And I'm sure there will be other evenings as well in other countries. Ah, now that's a great idea. Ladies and gentlemen, Nat Hentoff. <laughs> Nat, thank you very much. Give me just a couple of minutes. Let me check what's going on backstage. And then you are in for, not you, we are in for a real treat tonight. Thank you. <laughs>